Ready? <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we're here today to talk about the process of turning a book into a film or a television series and the pleasures and pitfalls along the way. On our panel, we have an embarrassment of riches. I was actually told to say that, but it does happen to be true. Um, Hanif Qureshi has written both novels and screenplays. Among his many credits are My Beautiful Laundrette, Sammy and Rosie Get Laid, The Mother, and one of my own favorites, Le Weekend. His novel, The Buddha of Suburbia, was also turned into a hugely successful and influential TV series. Stephen Frears directed both My Beautiful Laundrette and Sammy and Rosie Get Laid. Then, just to pick three credits out of the hat, there's Les Liaison Dangereuses, The Queen, and Philomena. More recently, his career was triumphantly resurrected by the success of uh, a very <laughs> English guy. Sorry, that's a really pathetic joke. I couldn't resist. Um, Sarah Waters is in the, I suspect, unique position of having had all her published works adapted for either film or television. Not only that, one of them, Fingersmith, has been filmed twice, once for television and once for the cinema. The film adaptation of her most recent novel, The Little Stranger, has just opened to great acclaim. And it stars Ruth Wilson. Uh, Ruth has won two Golden Globe Awards for The Affair and Jane Eyre, and two Olivier Awards for her stage work. Just to give a small flavor of her versatility, she starred in Luther as a sociopath and in the film Dark River as a sheep shearer. Yeah. <laughs> Paula Byrne has written a number of biographies of Jane Austen, Evelyn Waugh, and Kit Kennedy, John F. Kennedy's forgotten sister. She's also the author of Bell, the true story of Dido Bell, the extraordinary account of the illegitimate daughter of a slave and a Royal Naval captain, and how she grew up amongst the pressures and prejudices of 18th century England. Bell was made into a film starring Gugu Mabata Raw, Tom Wilkinson, and Miranda Richardson. Hanif. Oh, please. By way of a gentle loosener, Plainly, there's a big, there are different rules for writing books and screenplays. Is it possible to say what they are? I have to say that the fact that something may appear on television is always a relief to me because it probably means you don't have to go trouble yourself with the agony of having to read it. Um, but as, as, as a writer, and, and I, I'm doing an adaptation at the moment, I was thinking on the way here whether there, are, whether, whether, whether there are any suggestions you could actually make to anybody else about how to do it. But it's the same, same applies to whether you're writing a, a movie or a novel. You just have to sit there and suffer and, 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 and muck around with it until you find a way through it. The most important thing is that the, the, that the story on television or film works independently of, of the book. It has to work on its own terms. You take it for granted that people may or may not have, uh, uh, have read it, but it has to come alive in its own way. And the fact that a book is alive and, and, and has good characters and has meaning doesn't mean that the adaptation will. Um, you've just got to sit there until blood comes out of your ears, really, until it seems. I'm doing a book at the moment, actually. Uh, and the beginning of the book is really good. And the two main characters are, are very strong. At the end of the book, they don't meet again. Um, it doesn't really matter in the book because you, 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 you can say what they're thinking and feeling. Um, if you're doing it on the telly or as a movie, you've got to get them together again. They've got to be in the same space because it, it would seem absurd to the audience that they're not there. So occasionally you have to sort of prop it up a bit and put a bit in there and make it you know, work in, uh, independently of the story. So then you have to, I have to get, then go to the, the novelist and say, do you mind if I invent these scenes that are not in your book? without which it, it doesn't seem to work. She, luckily, she didn't seem to mind at all, but sometimes you'd have to do a major bit of, uh, of rebuilding to make it work. So it really depends on, on, on the story that you're doing, actually. Sarah, I wondered if the experience of having your work filmed has changed the way that you write at all, the way in which a story fits together. I mean, it seems to me that if you look at a really well-constructed screenplay, it's a bit like peering into the inside of a clock. And so the mechanics of the story are laid out in kind of bold relief, as it were. Yes, and I think that sometimes that um, you know a good screenplay um, can can make can tidy up 
a book um, and, and make a better film. Maybe The Godfather, or, or, yeah. you know, is an example of that. It's getting getting rid of the extraneous stuff. And certainly for me, um, I mean, I remember the first time I saw a screenplay based on one of my books, and that was Tipping the Velvet, which was my first novel, which was done on telly in 2002, quite a long time ago now. And of course, it's a shock. I think the novel is about 400 pages. It's a sort of leisurely, sprawling, picaresque novel, you know. And um, a sc screenplay, if you've ever, screenplay, ever seen a screenplay, you know, it's just a few lines of dialogue on each page and it was about maybe 120 pages. Andrew Davis's script it was, it was a great script, but it was quite shocking because, of course, my reaction was, where's, you know, where's all the, where are all the teeming streets of London that I've written about? But, of course, the teeming streets of London aren't supplied by the scriptwriter. They're, yeah. they're supplied by a whole different department, and I think that was a great shock for me, too, realising that, you know, a book has a soul, uh, you know, only begetter, and... Um, a, a film has a whole has a whole little industry sort of bringing it to life, um, and in terms of has it affected the way I write? I mean, I've had so many of them adapted now. I mean, not all of them actually. The most recent one, it, it, hopefully, it's the been playing guest though, has it? been optioned, yeah. and it's hopefully going to be done for telly. Um, so I've you know I've had so many of them done now that I would be lying if I said I you know as I was writing another one. You know, I do think might this work on telly, but I think it's that doesn't alter the way I haven't. You know, I haven't written for adaptation at all in any way. But what has happened is that I've become aware of. You know, a good screenplay is very good at getting at the heart of a scene, getting the nub of a scene, and those few lines of dialogue I was talking about are often the crux of a scene. And I've tried to take that realisation back to, to my own writing when I'm, when I'm crafting a scene to try and really get the essence of a scene. And is there a tiny part of you when you're writing a scene that is visualising what it might look like? Or think, is that you separate? You know, I think I did that anyway. Right. I think because I haven't grown up watching a lot of telly and film, I think that's how I just started writing. You know, I think the books were very visual right from the start because I tend to see a scene. I mean, I'm writing literary realism, you know, it's a very particular tradition. Um, but I tend to see a scene and then write it down very much. So uh, that hasn't changed at all because that was always there. Stephen, you once said to me, directors don't need to be able to write, they only need to be able to read. This well, is your... actually, that was Billy Wilder, but I'm happy Oh, fair enough. It'll do, it'll do, it'll do. So this is your gentle loosener. When you read a screenplay, I suppose I want to know, what are you looking for? And indeed, are you using different criteria to, ev to evaluate the quality of the writing than you would do if you were reading a book? No, you just read something and think, oh, this is great. I'll, let, I'll get out of bed to do this. Why do you have to think of anything else? I mean, you might on the way come across things you think, oh, well, that, perhaps that doesn't work, or it collapses a bit here, but it's just the pleasure and joy of what it is. You, I mean, when I read The Laundrette, it was easy. You just thought, this is fantastic. Why are you looking at me with such lack of conviction? <laughs> That's, I'm looking at you in complete accord. Ah, okay. <laughs> I didn't notice. Um, Ruth, you've done a number of adaptations. Jane Eyre, Small Island, Anna Karenina, Sweet Francaise. Is it a different process for you as an actor when there's a novel involved than there would be if there was simply you started from a screenplay? Um, it's not necessarily different, but it's, we well, do have, I, I, I kind of prefer it because you have a Bible and you have all the subtext written out for you. <laughs> So it's, um, you can refer to it and you can get underneath the skin of a character into what the writer intended with that character. Um, there's much more detail in a book than there is on a screenplay. So I really love having the book there as a reference. And I, with Jane Eyre, it was one of my first jobs and I had that book with me, with me the whole time as I was performing it and I'd reference it. So it does that make it easier for you? Yeah. Because it gives you, you know, you're not making it up. It's there already. It's, um, and it gives you insight, gives you clues as to how you might play, the, play that scene. And we had, you know, I emailed Sarah when I was doing Little Stranger. And it was interesting because that book is all through the eyes of Faraday, yeah. uh, the protagonist. And so he views my, ca my character in a totally, well, he's very specific, very subjective. So... There were lots of puzzles and questions about the character that I was playing that weren't on the page. Or they were, but they weren't um, implicit. 
Um, so I, I emailed Sarah and I said, had a number of questions. It's great, you know, as a novelist who's alive. <laughs> Not like Jane Eyre. So I could call her up and go, help me out. Um, and she was brilliant. She gave me some clues and some ideas about the character's sexuality, but also her past, um, which helped me play it. So yeah, it's, I love using novels or working from novels. Paula, when you wrote Belle, what came first, the book or the film, or do they actually kind of completely coincide? Well, they did coincide. It's a funny story, really, because um, I got a call from the film company, and they said to me, oh, we're, we're, we've got this amazing film called Belle. It's about a biracial girl brought up in the 18th century by Lord Mansfield, who helped abolish the slave trade, and we know you know about her. Um, what we'd really love you to do is um, people will not believe the story is true when they see it on the film. So could you write a tie-in book? Um, and I just, I said, I've got two questions. I said, they're the only sensible questions if you're an author. I said, one, how long have I got? And they said, you've got eight weeks. I said, second, how much are you going to pay me? <laughs> and when they, both those answers were sort of mod, kind of balanced, I said, I'd do it. So I had a very um, different experience. It, fascinatingly, I said, look, are you going to do the Somerset case? I said, I've got one historical question. I'm a, I'm a writer of nonfiction. Um, and I don't think one should be too sort of arsy about being purist about, because they're different genres, and that's fine. And as long, I think, as the movie's in the, in the spirit of, of the book, I don't care. But I said, are you going to do the Somerset case, which is this famous historical case when Lord Mansfield said, let the man go? And it began the sort of long process of the abolition of the slave trade. And they said, no, we're not going to do that. And I said, oh, that's sort of a bit sad. Um, and they said, but we are going to do the Zong massacre in which um, for a famous historical case when 45 uh, well slaves were thrown overboard to the sharks for an insurance scam because the, the slave uh, ship ran out of water en route to Jamaica. And I just thought, actually, that's a better story for this film. It was not the beginning of the slave trade. And, and it was a really clever idea to have the Zong massacre. So that, that was fine. So I, I saw the early cuts, and I, I was able to say that was historically accurate. It was great fun. Um, but I think they are different things, and I think one shouldn't get too hung up about it. Because Mark Haddon, who wrote uh, Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, said that the process of uh, having your work adapted for the screen was like watching someone perform surgery on your children. <laughs> Hanif, you adapted Buddha of Suburbia. Was that because you couldn't face anyone else doing it? Um, well, somebody else did do it once, actually. They did it before. They got some, <laughs> I, I, I didn't really want to do it, and so they got somebody else to do it. And then I read it, and I just kept thinking, well, you left that bit out, you should put that bit over there. And then they said, why don't you redo it yourself? So, so I did. But, what you say is right. Uh, mostly, you spend uh, you spend most of your time taking stuff out. You know, uh, you read a really good uh, 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 screenplay. It's amazing how little uh, there is actually on the page. You know, day. You know, da da da, and a bit of dialogue, and it's a massive scene. Um, but knowing how to write those little scenes and to put the right the, the good bits in, that's that's the mastery of, of your craft. Being able to boil it down to a few bits of dialogue and a bit of action, and then you're on to the next thing. It's much quicker and it's much shorter, and it has to be much sharper all the way through. And that's quite quite a tricky thing to do. It's really what you're doing when you're write, uh, uh, writing an adaptation or any sort of script. It's a very simple set of instructions, really, to the to the director. You say if you do that, and they say that, and they go over there, then you know you should you should be on your way. That it's it's the minimum really um, that you try to aim at. Whereas with a book. You do all the work, everything has to be there. Sarah, you, you haven't written adaptations of your own work. I'm wondering how protective you feel towards it. Well, you can't be too protective yeah. because, um, you know, it's not, go it's not going to be your book brought to life. People often say to me, what was it like to see your book brought to life? And to be honest, it's never really felt like that to me because it's always going to be another project. You know, it's, it's like I was saying before, it's authored, really, by lots of people, by the scriptwriter, by the director, by the by the cast, um, <coughs> and it's you know it's their thing. So I remember our exchange, Ruth, and it was very interesting. And I was very happy to give you details about you know that I felt about the 
the character of Caroline that you were playing. But I remember saying at the end, you know, but this is my Caroline, mm -hmm. and it might not be um, Lenny Abrahamson, the director. It might not be his Caroline. It might not be your Caroline, mm -hmm. you know. And I think you have to be prepared to let your book and your characters go to a certain extent. And you, me you mentioned the, um, the, the film adaptation of Fingersmith, which was a mm. Korean, um, mm. The Handmaiden mm. by Park Chan-wook, where he transposes the action from you know, 1860s London to 1930s Korea, um, and it works brilliantly. And it's, so much has changed, and yet the essence of, of the novel yeah. is still yeah. there. And to me, that was very exciting. I think there's sometimes a more creative um, Adaptation. Think of something like um, uh, Clueless, you know, which mm -hmm. was a kind of updating of Emma, Jane Austen's Emma. Mm -hmm. Something like that is often a bit more exciting than a very faithful but rather ploddy kind of adaptation. And did that mean in The Handmaiden, did you feel however different the setting was and everything like that, that the richness of tone was there in the way that you yeah, wanted? Yeah, because, you know, it's, it's, it's a, the novel is very much in the tradition of Wilkie Collins, this novel of, of sensation. It's kind of larger-than-life Victorian stuff. And Park Chan-wook was able to bring a car, kind of larger-than-lifeness of his own to that, which was a kind of extravagance of these interiors and this sort of very formal um, kind of life. And, the, you know, it, it was fascinating to me how much could migrate and yet remain the same. And I think, ultimately, it's about, you know, a, a story is, is about power dynamics between characters and things that shift those power dynamics. And really, I mean, this is what makes Shakespeare so easy to play in different settings and update and modernize, because that, you know, the essence is in these relationships between people, and you can really play those out in very, very different settings. Ruth, the, the character you play in The Little Stranger is described by Sarah in the book as, quote, noticeably plain, thickish legs and ankles, <laughs> the worst dress sense of anyone I ever knew. <laughs> Uh, it's not much of a morale boost, is it? I mean, I, I suppose I'm wondering, that, are you looking to get to the essence of Sarah's character by other means, or are you ploughing your own furrow, or is it a bit of both? It's a bit of both, I think. I mean, I, um, yeah, it's definitely a wow, brilliant cast for this. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect casting. Um, but no, I think it's a bit of both. Like, we, we did discuss, I mean, I had in it, we sort of knew it was, he was slightly, again, Faraday was fetishizing slightly uh, her look, Caroline's look. So that's his perspective of her. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's finding some ground of her reality and her truth as a character that's outside of his perspective. Um, so yeah, we had, it, it was about finding an essence of that and trying to serve um, Sarah's Caroline, but also what I could feasibly do and move to um, and what we could all do. So, and it's a period piece, it's set post-war, it's a very specific time of class. So again, all those things filter into how you manifest that character with accent um, and mannerisms and gait. I mean, her gait is talked about. And so that was quite fun coming up with some kind of movement that moves it away from me to this character. But it's always going to be a hybrid of you because you bring yourself, you bring your own personal experiences or your own um, reflections on this character or their, what they're going through, it's definitely filtered through you. So that's going to infect what the, or, sh or change what the character is. So let's say hypothetically, if you felt that you were leaving the original, you were doing an adaptation of a novel and you felt that you were leaving the original character, as it were, too far behind, yeah. would that bother you? Um, a little bit. I, well... I mean, something like Anna Karenina, for example, that was very, um, Joe Wright had a very kind of artistic vision of that and very different from the book itself. So the characters were much bigger and bolder and wilder than perhaps, perhaps they are in the book, in the novel. And we had to go with that vision. And that was quite fun. That was fun. So you sort of leave it behind and you, I wouldn't carry the book around as a Bible in that respect. Um, I think it depends on the director. It depends on the vision he has. Um, and you try and bring the essence again of what the book is and what that character is, but you, you would have to leave it behind and just be confident in that <laughs> and hope that the author likes it at the end of the day. <laughs> and Stephen, do you have a fixed idea? When you come, start up at the beginning of a day shooting, do you have a fixed idea of how you want a particular character to come across? Or are you not necessarily entirely fluid about it, but pretty fluid. Well, I've done all that. So you've done time, all, yeah. I've done all that by the time I get there. <laughs> I mean, uh, in, in 
principally in casting, you've, you've made that decision. Yeah. It should be this kind of person. So I, uh, is that the answer? You, no, that, but but answer? were you actually, you won't have rehearsed with an actor or an actress. I don't like you? rehearsing. I'm not very good at it. So what happens they do if it. an actor or an actress plays something <laughs> in a way you don't like? If it's Judy Dench, you go and talk to her, and then she says, you mean act better? And I say yes. Right, right. <laughs> and what about when... I mean, I can't yeah. answer... I, I, by the time you get there, you've sorted all those things out. Not in a sort of a disgust way, but you've just arrived. And look, you're playing, you know, Hugh Grant, you're playing this character. He's a highly intelligent man, as most actors are, and you, know, you don't have those sort of differences. Did you talk to Hugh about Thorpe's character a lot beforehand? No. <laughs> Why would I do that? Well, some people might. It's not wholly outlandish. <laughs> he came to me and he said, oh, he said, the research for this is heaven. <laughs> he loved doing the research. He knew far more about it by the time we shot. And, and generally, I find the actors know more about it than I do. <laughs> it's very, very, I mean, I've never been present at when a script was written. I don't understand what writers do. I, I'm consumed with admiration. But the truth I, is, I, Stephen, sometimes you turn... You look at the rushes, you look at the stuff you've shot, and you know that the tone is wrong, that that's a bit off, that, don't you? And then you would, you would dump it, or you'd start again, or you'd think you about how to do it. And you make mistakes, and you correct yourself as you go along. Yeah, you would do that, wouldn't you? Yeah. Well, I have done it. Yeah. <laughs> I know you have. <laughs> but I've never, I've never been So present. the idea that you just turn up and it all just sort of... No, on the contrary, because you turn up, you do it, and then you think, oh, that was wrong. I see, I'll do it again tomorrow, and I won't tell anyone. <laughs> but I've not been present when a script was written. In fact, I did once sit with Christopher Hampton. He was writing a script, and I couldn't understand. I said, well, why do you go from that scene to that scene? It was completely incomprehensible to me. Did you ever read Dangerous Liaison of the book, as opposed to the script? The great advantage that I had <coughs> was that what I read was the film script which was from a play that Christopher had written, which was from the novel that the... So I did eventually read it. Did you? Yeah. Oh, yes. No, no, no. I mean, <laughs> you won't, you won't You're sounding very sceptical. You won't catch me out on that one. And indeed, <laughs> my main aim in the preparation of it was that there were these long, long scenes between the Marquise and the Vicom, between John Malkovich and Glenn. <coughs> and I sum the thought of doing them all was so depressing. And I gradually got... I got rid of one. And Christopher would say, well, this is this particular letter that Leclerc Le wrote. And so we reintroduced, we le reintroduced letter writing to the, to the film, yeah. which just gave it variety and was momentarily more interesting. So, of, of course, the essence is all that matters. And then people would talk to me, people in Paris would talk to me about it, about the writing. And I said, well, I don't read French, so I don't, I don't know how Christopher arrived at this brilliant way of telling the story. I said, I can see it's brilliant, but don't ask me the process that he went through. I think he did write it two or three times, trying to get the tone. The tone is key, of course, isn't it? Well, I think so, yeah, I think so. And the tone in your book and Russell T. Davis' script was very, very good and very, very clear. It didn't, you know... You didn't have to go into a room with a towel around your head. I mean, it was just straight, it was pretty obvious. Yeah, but it's still quite hard to translate into film, isn't it? Not for me. <laughs> OK, <laughs> right. <laughs> I was going to That tell. would be testament to your well, greatness, you of course. Yeah, not, I can do that. Other people can do that. <laughs> Paula Bell is about a mixed-race girl in the 18th century, as you said. <laughs> no, 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 we're on the head. Um, we were told to separate the two men. Y yes, and they I were told not to sit why. next to one another. <laughs> um, I'm wondering that Bell, obviously it's a story with a lot of relevance to today, and are you inevitably telling her story from a modern perspective? And does that matter? Or is it informed by current ideas? Well, I mean, I, I just think about what Sarah said about because I've, I've written quite a few books about Jane Austen, I was just very struck when Sarah said uh, what she said about Clueless, which I think is the best Jane Austen adaptation. Mm. 
It's an adaptation of Emma, and there's only one reference, there's one character called Elton. That's the only clue that this is an adaptation of Emma. And by far, I think it is the best Jane Austen adaptation. And I think if Jane Austen were alive today, she would say, that is me, because it's so funny, it's so irreverent, it totally, it's nuanced, it gets it on all sort of, sorts of levels. And with Belle, one of my problems with Belle was um, when I had the chat with the director, I said, do you actually know there are only eight known facts about the person you want me to write a book about? <laughs> um, and it was very interesting. I was writing about Kit Kennedy at the time. Kit, who her very first country weekend was here at Clifton in 1938 as a guest of Nancy Astor. And the Kennedy Library, sorry, I, I'm the nerd on the channel, so you just bear with me. I'm the nerdy person. I don't know why, you know, I'm an illustrious company. Um, but it, it, Rose Kennedy's archive alone has 80 million pieces in it. That's just Rose. And there are nine Kennedy children. And that's not JFK. So I'd gone, you know, I was going from the sublime to the ridiculous, really. That I'm getting somebody saying, can you write a book for whom we know eight known facts? And then in the Kennedy archive saying, how can I, condem how can I get all of this information about the Kennedys into one book? So it was a really interesting challenge. But of course, you want to be true to the story, going back to your question. I know, I mean, they did some modern up to, for instance, Belle fell in love with a white man. In real life, it was her, her, her father's valet. They made him a lawyer based on Granville Sharp, who was the great abolitionist. It sort of worked, you know. It, that wasn't my book, because my book was, I was hoping to be as accurate as possible for people who were interested. So they did take liberties, but as I said, it's a different genre. And it, it was still very much sort of in the spirit. But it was an interesting challenge, sort of working with that as, as a writer who spends most of her time in a library and in an archive. Um, so it was really sort of thrilling. And then with the Kennedy book, I'm, I'm now writing a screenplay with an amazing man called Simon Aboud. And I'm so, f just speaking to the pan here in the panel, I'm so amazed by the discipline of screenwriting because it's so different to what I do and how a writer can just condense something into two lines. And you think, well, oh, that took me two years to, <laughs> to even think about that conceit. And then suddenly they've got it so quickly. So I'm, I'm sort of in awe, really, f for the whole sort of uh, process. I don't know if I've answered your question really, but. So how long is the Hitchcock book of Bell? Hitchcock would say to his writers, you can have that much dialogue. That much dialogue? You can have what, that inch much and dialogue. a half? No, yeah, you can have that much. And never more than that? Well, it just would then. Yeah. It doesn't bear thinking about. <laughs> so, just, so how long is the, is the book of Bell? <laughs> it must be a high school or something. It was the shortest of my books. <laughs> so really, um, and the interesting thing about it was, I mean, it's 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 a, you know it, it's an eighty thousand word book, I think. Um, but I, what I had to do as a real challenge as a writer was to really contextualise what it was like to be a, a biracial woman in eighteenth century England. Where, I, well, I didn't know much about it, but there were black balls, there were black assemblies, there was a whole black culture, thriving black culture. There were ten thousand black people living in England in in, in the seventeen nineties. So it was fascinating and, and finding out, reading newspapers from the time, what was happening in that culture, how many mixed race marriages were there. Um, and so uh, there was very little known about Dido Bell for various reasons. Her adopted father was the Lord Chief Justice, very apt at the moment when thinking about uh, you know, men in high office. Um, and if there'd been any sort of slant that maybe one of the reasons he was lenient towards the slave trade was because he had a mixed race daughter, then that would have been quite sort of interesting. So there were things that I was pulling together, strands that were pulled together. But I think the film, the film felt very different to my book, but it, it, it was fantastic and it brought her story um, to so many, so many people, particularly in America where it was, it was a bigger success, I have to say, than here. Hani, for that stretching a point entirely to breaking point, a breaking point. There are certain parallels between Belle and My Beautiful Laundrette. It's obviously it was about a gay romance between a young Pakistani man and a young British man. And I wanted to actually ask, <laughs> taking my life in my hands, both you and Stephen, um, <laughs> whether you both had a sense when you were making it that you were breaking new ground and taking audiences into a place they hadn't been before. Well, I remember I used to work at uh, Riverside Studios mm. that was run by uh, a, a good friend of Stephen's called Peter Gill. And I remember, uh, I worked there, and I remember Peter saying uh, one time, he said, you know, you never see enough gay relationships on television or in the cinema, do you? 
And I thought, no, you don't actually. And then when I, 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 I was writing the, the, the story of my beautiful laundrette about a Pakistani boy and a, and a white boy running a laundrette together, I, I'd written the whole thing, but they, there was no snogging in it really between them. And I thought, if they touch, if they kiss, if something electric happens between them, then the, the whole film so, sort of falls into, in, in, into place. So I didn't go out of my way to think of doing something transgressive, it, but it had obviously been in the back of my mind. And, uh, uh, and having lived through the, the 70s and, and, and what was happening with the so-called counterculture in the theater and the cinema, I just thought there aren't enough men kissing on television these days. And when they kissed, the film really sort of came alive in this particular way. So it just seemed necessary at the time. And it might have been easier for me to do it as a, as a, as a not gay person, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it just seemed natural to me. It didn't seem an odd, difficult thing to, to do. Um, and then suddenly it had that spot. The story just just worked as, as a love story rather than as a, as a critique of Thatcherite capitalism, which is not, <laughs> it's not necessarily something you would rush to the cinema to see. <laughs> And Stephen, when you were making it, did you have a sense, my God, this is really going to shake things up? No. Never crossed my mind. And were you surprised by the success of it? Yes. I mean, delighted. Yes, it, it never crossed... I don't think it crossed anybody's mind. Stephen went to some trouble to stop the film going into the cinema, I remember. <laughs> I remember, because <laughs> it was made for television, it was made by Channel 4. And obviously they made uh, te- uh, these films, on, shot them on 16 mil, uh, uh, for television. And some, somebody said to Tim Bevan, the producer, uh, why don't we put this in the pictures in the cinema, Romain Hart, who owned the screen on the green. And Stephen said, oh, I don't think we should do that. We don't should do that. So we had some struggle getting it into the cinema. But I may be wrong, Stephen, is that right? The idea that people would go out to see a film about a gay Pakistani laundrette owner seemed inconceivable. <laughs> I accept my stupidity. <laughs> But I, too, thought, I thought it was about Thatcherite economics. But, though, I do remember... <laughs> somewhere in there it is, but not, perhaps not. But I do remember there's a scene when Dan removes an eyelash. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. And I remember yeah. reading it for the first time and thinking, oh, that's absolutely wonderful. That was the extent of my scholarship. And then everything flowed from that. And Ruth, you were saying that you, I think, have got your grandmother, is it a grandmother's memoir that you're having adapted? Yeah, I've just recently, it's actually coming out at the end of the year, but it's, a, it's my grandmother's memoir, and it's going to be inspired by the memoir. I mean, at first we, it's her story and her life with her husband, who turned out to be a spy. He wrote 27 spy novels, and he had four wives, from which he never divorced, and they never knew about each other. Now, in the memoir, my grandmother only ever knew about one wife. Right. And when she died, we then found out a lot more. So there was a lot more information. There were two more wives come out of the woodwork and their families. And all the things he got up to in MI5 came out of the woodwork too. So we had to work from different source material to create the drama. So it wasn't just, in spite, it just, wasn't just her memoir. It became more than that. And by doing that, you kind of changed her character because... We had her, we have her finding out all the wives. So she wasn't pursuing the truth when she, in reality, but we have her doing that in this drama. So it was interesting to sort of see how you start changing character according to what's available to you and what the story you want to tell. And also it's drama, so it's a, it's a TV drama, and at the end of each episode you have to have a cliffhanger, you know, brings on. So you realise the structure of storytelling is so interesting that you have to have this thriller that comes through to some kind of climax. And have a wife per episode. And a wife you? per episode, exactly. Yeah. So, um, which, so I'm telling you all the story, I'm comp- spoiling it entirely. Oh, another wife. Uh, another wife's yeah. coming out. Yeah, um, so it was like that, it was like that's, that's kind of how we, stri- it was really interesting, the process. To and see. how involved were you? in the actual way in which the story is oh, told? Oh, lot, lots. Right. Um, and you had a very, do you have a clear idea from the beginning of how you wanted it told? 
I, my grandmother wrote this memoir in two parts. The first part, she was all about her relationship with her husband, and the second part was about her relationship with God. She found God after everything happened. Right. And she insisted in her will that she wanted the story to be told in its entirety. The second doesn't exist without the first, and vice versa. So she, I knew I wanted to put that on screen. The BBC a bit reluctant about religion, full stop. I mean, how do you put that into drama? It's quite hard. No one really wants to hear about it. Or, they were a fundamentalist. They're very well, keen on fundamentalists. Yeah, well, <laughs> she is a fundamentalist. But, um, so we did. It was interesting. But I knew I wanted to push that. And actually, I'm really happy I did, because it's, it does complete the story in a really interesting way. Um, but yes, yeah, it was, it was, it's been a really amazing process, and I've loved doing it and being part of that and seeing how incredible it is that these... You know, this writer, Anna Simon, she's taken it from lots of different source materials, including interviewing family members, and created something quite unique. Um, and the way she's done that with, again, you know, stripping it back and finding and piecing in thriller moments throughout, how you drop nuggets of information. It's very clever. I'm, I'm in awe of what she's done. And Sarah, when we spoke on the phone the other day, you were saying, and we were talking about feeling protective to bombs. <laughs> um, and you were saying that the one thing you felt most protective about was the gay aspects of your work. And let us take what I suspect would be an extremely far-fetched scenario, that someone wanted to turn one of your books into a kind of heterosexual romance. In a way, there wouldn't be that much you could do about it, is there? Um, there wouldn't be once I'd sell the option, yeah. no. But of course, I, you know, I wouldn't sell an option before having kind of quite lengthy conversations with the producers about what their vision was. And I was certainly always reassured that nobody wanted to muck around with the novels, with the stories, you know, that much. But yes, I think I, if, when I thought about it, I think if there was any, any issue I was concerned about, it was that, you know, I knew that this was mainstream TV and t taking on a lesbian story, with say something like Tipping the Bell, well, with all of them, really. Um, and, you know, I, you know, I didn't want, I wanted that to be treated respectfully. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, My Beautiful Laundrette, by the way, was a really big film for me. Mm. And my gay friends. I mean, I was very sort of, a, you know, a young queer person then. But it was, it was really, and it was so great that it was a, sort of a contemporary. You know, I mean, I've seen things like Brideshead Revisited, which was sort of great, and you know, the homoeroticism of that was exciting. But this was just, just so <coughs> exciting. Anyway, so yeah, I just didn't want, I, I, you know, I wanted it to be treated sensitively and respectfully. And you know, there were things like, I mean, mainstream culture never really gets butchness. You know butchness, kind of lesbian mannishness. It's always been such a big part of lesbian culture. And it's, you know, it's something that I like and relish. And of course, you know, the girls in Tipping the Velvet had too much makeup on and <laughs> things like that. Um, yeah, and you know, The Night Watch, which, which was adapted for the BBC, had two kind of butch characters in it. And they just couldn't cope with two. They had to get rid of one of them. Um, but they kept her name, and I found it so distressing that she wasn't this kind of tough little toughy anymore. That I said, "Look, it's okay. You can change her, but can't give her a new name." So there were things like that that I felt a bit protective of, you know. Um, but apart from that, I was I was happy for them to, you know, to 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 to, to make it because, as Ruth was saying, you know, real life on screen wouldn't work. You have to, and novels in a way can be sprawling and leisurely, but on, on they have to be leaner on screen. So. And how powerful, or otherwise, do you feel? <laughs> as a writer. I mean, it's an odd feeling, isn't it, to go on a film set when you're a writer oh, where, because in theory, yeah. the thing wouldn't be happening unless yeah. you'd written it. But on the other hand, you're sort of superfluous at the Completely same time. Completely redundant by that point. I mean, everybody's terribly nice to you. I've, I've visited the sets, I think, for nearly all of them. And um, it's, been, it's been a great day out, you know, and watched a bit of the filming. It's fantastically exciting. Um, but no, I mean, you, nobody really wants you there because you get in the way. And of course, by this point, the big difference between writing a novel and making a film is that you write a novel, you know, over in my case, sort of four years, and you take, you, you, know, you take your time and you go through high points and low points. But once they start shooting a film, it's incredibly expensive. Yeah. So there's this sense of, quite exciting sense, I think, on set. But also, you know, you don't want to get in the way, and it's this whole team of people, lots of really burly blokes, because they need things moved around at short notice. So it's a very, it's quite an oddly male atmosphere, mm. which was quite, yeah. which was startling to yeah. me, you know, to see my sort of sensitive lesbian Victorian novels surrounded by these big burly blokes. It was surprising. <laughs> <laughs> and Stephen, how do you feel about having an author on set? I mean, I, I, I like suppose it. you like it. Yeah, 
They got he us just likes to have mess. someone there to talk to. I well, don't know. I, you know, I, you know, no, I but they the... got us into this mess. They can help get us out of it. <laughs> well, yeah. Okay, that's... Uh, I, I think it's great. I mean, all you're doing is, is making things up. In fact, one of the th things that I'm most aware of is that a lot of the writing... The writing really goes on until you finish the film, until you've edited the film. And it just never stops. And in a way, I find the writing in the editing room possibly more interesting or something where you can contribute more. I say when it's completely theoretical, I don't know how you deal with that. That's what writers do. I could tell various stories if you want to hear them. Yeah, go on. <laughs> well, on Philomena, I remember, eventually I said, look, at this point in the script, it should turn round. I don't know why, but these kind of films, by which I meant 30s comedies in America, they turn round and, as it were, the girl, instead of being pursued by the man, it becomes the pursuit or whatever. And Steve and Jeff tried to deal with what I was being so <coughs> confused about. And Judy said, put her finger on the same spot and said, it goes soft here. Anyway, I shot it. And as soon as I saw the film, it was really to do with why Judy's character, why Philomena stayed in America after she discovered that her son was dead. She stays in America, and in the original script, Steve Coogan's character persuades her to stay. Well, as soon as you shot her, you took one look at Judy's face and realized that nobody was going to persuade her to do anything. The only person who could persuade her was she herself. So we went back and reshot it, rewrote it, reshot it, and then it was fine. Um, and it, it was very, very striking how I couldn't, you know, you think I've been doing this a long time. Why didn't I know that that was what you had to do? Although I assume in Hollywood in the 30s and 40s, they did know things like that. You know, turn it, turn it upside down. And I thought that was right. It's odd. When you make a film, somebody somewhere has had a really good idea. I remember when Peter Morgan wrote The Queen. <clears throat> they wanted him to write about the death of Lady Di, about that week. <coughs> and, um, and he went and looked into it, and he came back and said, look, this isn't very interesting. The character who is interesting is the Queen. That seems to me brilliant. I mean, mm -hmm. to actually have that insight. And of course, he was absolutely right that she was the character who was most conflicted and, in a way, out of her time for that moment. So, so with a great deal of, oh, why do, you, oh, do we have to have Tony Blair? A lot of grumbling about Tony Blair reappearing because my dad <laughs> made the deal. But of course, that was, that was what the film was looking for. And he had the wisdom. So when you talk about clueless, somebody somewhere, I have no idea who, somebody said, do a modern day version of Emma. But who it was, I have no idea. But that is the person who you should be given the award to because that's genius. It's really when you realise something, the moment when you're able to realise something, isn't it? Whether you realise at the right moment or whether it's too late, when you can see that something has to be done in a particular way from yes. a particular angle. I remember asking you when you decided that the boy should kiss. Well, luckily it was when I, when I was writing it. But with my beautiful laundrette, there were lots of scenes that I rewrote on the bus at lunchtime when we were actually shooting. And I would, because I worked in the theatre, I was used to doing that. And I'd write a bit of paper and hand it to Dan, hand it to Gordon, then they'd say the lines, and then I'd cut a bit, give it to them again. So if, you, if we're talking about whether the writers should be on, 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 on set, I found that really useful because you can see that the actors are, are, are doing things and something is developing between them that yes. you can then write a bit more for them. And if you've got a, a, a a decent director, a flexible director, then you can change the way you're going to shoot it. If you've, you've got a director who's worked out exactly what he or she is going to do that afternoon, it's unchanging, then you can't develop the material as you go. So I learned a lot from actually sitting there on set, having seen what they'd shot in the morning and knowing what they were going to shoot in the afternoon and, and then at lunchtime writing a bit that was, that, 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 that was better than, than I had originally done because I could see what the actors were doing. So if you ask about whether the writer should be on set, that seems to me to be quite an advantage because suddenly you think, oh, it would be even better if that happened between them and so on. But of course, a lot of directors don't want you on, 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 on set. Roger Michel, with whom I did uh, three films, never wanted me on set because 
He said, I looked at him in an intimidating way. <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> I can see that. Uh, uh, well, there were very good reasons why I looked at him, obviously, <laughs> in, 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 in an intimidating way. But it seems to me a great advantage to have the writer around for you to be that. Anthony Burgess said that he felt that film was an inferior medium to literature because it couldn't tell you what was going on inside someone's head, which I don't think is necessarily true. But I'm just really wondering, I suppose, in terms of telling a story, are the things that film can do the novel can't. Well, the film of Clockwork Orange is much better than yeah. the novel of Clockwork yeah. Orange. I hope somebody pointed that out to Anthony Burgess. <laughs> <laughs> film can be still. Film yeah. can be still in a way that, that um, fiction can't. I was right, struck with that with The Little Stranger, actually, because yeah. Lenny, the director, often has these very, very still shots um, that you just have to experience as a viewer. And, of course, in a novel or a short story, you can, su you can suggest stillness, you can describe stillness, but by the very act of reading, you know, the, yeah. the reader yeah. is not still. That, that's an interesting thing, I think. And, I mean, good books, as we know, don't necessarily make good films, and bad books can often make very good films. Graham Greene, Joseph Conrad are often cited as, in this regard, although in Greene's case, of course, you'd have to disregard The Third Man and The Fallen Idol, both of which I think are masterpieces. But I, in terms of... The, Insofar as there's a general rule here, what, what makes a good film? Is it entirely to do with the strength of the narrative? No, <coughs> no but there is no answer to... There is no answer. There is no answer, answer to your question, or there are a million answers yeah. to your question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or I don't know if there, if there is one answer. Let me know, because I've never found it. Yeah. It's On interesting. Conrad is bad, because Conrad is all internal, isn't it? I remember they asked me to do Nostromo, and yeah. you realise this was all internal and very, very difficult. Um, but when you look at The Third Man, you know absolutely what everybody's thinking. You know how complex... Mm -hmm. uh, how complex... You know, because Green, Green was brilliant at it. So, I mean, it, these generalisations are very unhelpful. And on that very unhelpful note, um, well, I think we should throw this out to the, So any questions you would like to lob, we will endeavour to answer. Sorry, I, I suppose mainly for Stephen Frears, but for everyone, really. When you, when you go from uh, some of the very strongly European or British projects you've done, working with that literary material to something like The Grifters, which is very American, obviously. Do you, do you have to kind of change your angle of approach or do things differently? Well, I would be inclined to say no, but I remember with The Grifters, Martin Scorsese rang me. I had been waiting for this call all my life, and there he was <laughs> on the phone. Um, we eventually, we found a writer, Donald Westlake, who was a brilliant, brilliant writer. And he wrote a script, and I said, no, 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 this isn't right. And he said, right, sit down, go through the book, show me the scenes you want to have in. And I showed him the scenes that I liked. And then he, and I'll, he said, I'll write you a script with those scenes in. So he was very, very craftsman-like, uh, craftsman-ish in his, in his approach, craftsman-like. Uh, and I showed him the scenes, and he just said, oh, my God, you really do like B-movies, which is, was always my starting point. <laughs> but I didn't find the culture... I don't think I found it... I mean, I knew noir films from Hollywood, so I knew, you know, I knew what film we were making. But Donald was very clever, and he would steer me in certain directions. I mean, that... The quote of Billy Wilder's is very, very profound. The film director doesn't have to be able to write, but he has to know how to read. And I would flatter myself by saying, oh, I know how to, I can read films. Nick Hornby used to say that the film of High Fidelity was like going to a reading of the book. You just know what the thing is about, and you know where the essence lies, and you know what is valuable about it in the language and in the behavior of the characters. And I knew it was a love story, and that was sort of the end of it, after everybody had groaned and said, oh, you're ruining it by setting in Chicago. I knew that wasn't the case. But it's, it's largely intuitive. Yeah, 
It's coming. I would actually say there are probably too many adaptations. I think it's a kind of laziness, because already you've got the source material, you've got the, the novel or the story or whatever. It seems to me much more interesting to go to a writer and say, why didn't you write an original uh, uh, movie or an original TV? And they're much fewer and far between, actually, mm -hmm. because you begin with nothing. You say to a writer, go, on, go, go and write five parts. And the writer sits down with nothing in their head and begins. I can see it's more dodgy to, to commission someone to do that than to say, here's a novel. But actually, it's often more interesting. And most of the stuff that I grew up watching on telly, um, if you think of something like uh, Edge of Darkness, yeah. for instance, um, it was not based on any, any or, original material. Troy Kennedy Martin had this idea, had these characters, and, and, and he wrote it as an original story. And it would seem to me to be a shame if the, the, the if that happened less in the future because people want to know what the outcome is. They want to buy your book as they indeed bought your very, very good book. Um, it seems a shame, though, that people uh, want the security of knowing what the story, what the characters, what the whole thing is in advance. Well, also, I think from, I'm a producer, and from a producer's perspective, it's, there's so much about having pre-awareness amongst a, a kind of audience of the material, which is, is often why adaptation is something that's looked at. But I, I'm a huge admirer of all of your work, so I'm really excited about this panel. But I did want to ask specifically about a very English scandal, what it was like for you to do something in three parts uh, as opposed to you know, feature film length. I, I, don't, I don't honestly think I noticed that it was in three parts. <laughs> I mean, that's to say, well, it was what you were saying. You know, the first part ends with him saying, we've got to kill Scott. Second part ends with the dog being shot. You know, I mean, it's not very complicated, is it? Oh, end with a climax. Quite elementary. So did it feel like making a film? You know, yes. just, yeah. Yeah, and it, well, possibly three films. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it, and Russell Davis, who's very, very clever and brilliant, he'd, he'd done all that work. And there we were, resur you know, so was resurrecting, the tone, the resurrecting tone... this forgotten book. So the tone that you achieved in in um, in it was that very much in the script because it's so brilliant the it, tone it, of it. It was in the script. It was in the book, and it was in the real events. You know, I mean, yeah. I'm old enough to remember yeah. Thorpe's trial. Hmm. Well, every schoolboy in the country they were making jokes about. It. I remember Steve Coogan telling me the jokes that they made at school about when it was on the front pages. So you knew it was a sort of comic story, except that there was also a man's life being threatened. And, um, yeah, and and all that, so Peter Cook, Peter Cook's parody of um, Cantley. So it was all there, and it wasn't, I say, to me, it was pretty obvious. So I can't pretend I lay in a dark room. And well, you're very it? good at the fruity as well. You made it Apparently, very, 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 very fruity. good at the fruity. But it was very good at the fruity. It was fruity. Yes. It was any fruity script. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Getting the Vaseline quotient was probably the key, I think. That's when Hugh Grant's father switched off. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for Stephen and Hanif. With your film, My Beautiful Laundrette, you broke you, um, certain Asian stereotypes. So I wonder what sort of feedback did you receive from the Asian community and how did you deal with it? I remember being in New York when the film opened, and I went with Marcy Bloom, who was the publicist, and there were huge demonstrations all the way around the cinema from uh, 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 the Muslim community. And I, it was before the Muslims have got really worked up, and they, they were quite nice, and I went up to them and I asked them what they didn't like, and they assured me that there were no homosexuals in any Muslim lands whatsoever, and I got it wrong. Um, and they had their demonstrations, then they threatened to blow up the cinema, and they held their placards. So they got really fed up about the whole thing. And I think it seems to me to be that that is a very, very good sign when you're writing something that people are really annoyed about it in that particular way. Um, it was also a time when there were very few so-called Asians or people of color on the telly at all. And so the community got rather annoyed that when you put them on the telly, they were being shown as homosexuals. Um, 
And the answer was that, to, to that really was not that there should be fewer homosexuals, but there should be you know, more of our community on, on, on TV and its you know, much broader aspects. And that was the beginning, I think, of, of the idea that you could put Asian people on television without everybody turning off immediately. Um, because when I first started to write about so-called Asian characters, I remember some, you know, someone actually saying to me, this is really good, but do they have to be Asian? <laughs> and that rather discouraged me for a bit, actually, I thought, because I thought I was doing something that, that, that was new and, and, and fresh and hadn't been done before. Um, so that's, yeah, people got really fed up, but lots of people since then, people still come up to me and say, you know, I was a 12-year-old Pakistani boy sitting in my front room and I saw my beautiful laundrette and I felt liberated by that. And if anybody, one person, ever says that to you, then your life has not been wasted, it seems to me. Stephen, do you have any thoughts about that? One of the advantages I had was almost total ignorance of um, Muslim lives. Uh, was, to me, when I read it, it was like reading Hamlet. It was just about a boy rebelling against his father. I didn't have any understanding. I mean, I had to be taught everything. And the, Hanif and the cast, they would explain what was going on, really. Oh, really? oh, is that, oh, you know, and I would slowly learn what I was making a film about. Afterwards, I discovered, I can remember, I think I was teaching and there was a boy who might have been Indian, but anyway, he described watching it with his parents and how shocked his parents had been in Leicester or someone like that. And I slowly started to understand that there was, there was another point of view. And I suspect that the film wouldn't be made now because you'd be too aware of the possibility of giving offense to the, to the, to the conventional Muslims or the conventional Asians. So you would, you would stop yourself. But at the time, I knew nothing. So I did it without a care in the world. So ignorance was a great blessing, as it generally is. <laughs> My question is for Paula. Um, when you are writing historical biographical novels, what's your approach to dialogue as you're researching and reading books and letters? How do you come about imagining what their thoughts and their words would have been? Well, I don't really. I mean, I can't bear biographies that put thoughts that aren't there. I'm really quite nerdy about this. I can't, can't bear that. Um, so I don't. So when I'm writing um, biographies, I, I try to avoid anything that's, that's like that. I have just written two novels. One came out earlier this year, and I'm about to write a historical novel about Molina Dietrich. And it's been, a, it's been fantastic writing dialogue. And, and I think, um, well, I never thought I could. And I had a go at it, and I read it out to my teens, because I thought, they're your worst critics. They're going to tell you it's rubbish. And when they started laughing, um, I thought, OK, I think I can do dialogue. I mean, it, it just felt something that was very natural, but something I thought I could never do because I, I was always an academic and never did that. So you won't find anything in my biographies of what I think people think. Um, if that sort of makes sense. Um, so no, I sort of avoid, it makes me cringe when I read biographies and they say, so-and-so thought this. And you go, how do you know that? How do you know what they thought? Unless you're absolutely, completely sure that they've said it. Um, having said that, having writing Kick, Kennedy was a different experience. I wrote a very episode. I, I wrote it almost like a film. I kept seeing these sort of vignettes, these little stories in my head, and I think that led me to the whole new episode of writing novels. Because I just thought there's a more creative way. Biography is very. I think biography is moving in very different directions. You get partial lives, a whole life of Shakespeare in one year, 1599. I think biography is no longer sort of cradle to grave, not so boring. It's become really flexible and interesting. And I think I was just sort of, the natural progression for me was, can I do this? Can I write dialogue? But I would really hesitate to do that in, in nonfiction, because it would just make me cringe. Does, does that make sense? Now, I'm afraid we're out of time. Okay, uh, about this novel about oh. Marlene Dietrich, it's available. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, we can talk about that. We are going off to the bookshop, those of us who have books to sign, I think. Um, I'd like to thank you all very much for coming. I'd like to thank the panellists and 
Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Whitney, so it's a novel about uh, an angel and her daughter. And uh, there's, it's a sort of, um, well, it's an historical novel. It's about narcissism and the, uh, the ugly daughter, this beautiful woman. And then there's a figure of Noel Coward, who's 